Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial mm -hmm. subjects with interesting people. David Hersani is a senior writer at National Review and a syndicated columnist. But today we're going to discuss his new book, Eurotrash, Why America Must Reject the Failed Ideas of a Dying Continent. So I'm going to ask him about some of the most pervasive myths of European superiority vis-a-vis -vis America, um, mostly coming from the left, but uh, perhaps a little bit now in the last few years coming from the right as well. So we'll get into a little bit of that as well. So uh, welcome, David, to High Noon. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So let's let's go through some of the most common um, right off the bat here, some of the most common unfavorable comparisons that people hear about America vis-a-vis -vis European countries. So let, let's start with, with healthcare. We hear that the American life expectancy is lower, that our infant mortality stats are higher, and that we spend more of our GDP um, on healthcare for dubiously not as good results, right? Um, at least according to those two stats. So why is that the wrong way to compare these two systems? Well, those are the three big arguments we hear, right, most of the time. So first of all, the argument about uh, life expectancy. I mean, it is there is no real evidence that life expectancy is lower in the United States because of healthcare delivery. It has to do with lifestyle choices. And granted, a lot of Americans are, are more unhealthy or they eat more unhealthy. We have a lot of obesity. This is just how it is. Now, um, those are personal choices people make, but also uh, driving. We drive far more than Europeans. Uh, we live in the suburbs, we drive, we have many more vehicular deaths. Now, you may think vehicular deaths are a terrible thing. I do, of course. I think it's a risk that people take when they drive, but that has nothing to do with healthcare delivery. Um, we also live much more uh, rugged lifestyles in many places in the United States than others do. And these are choices that we make. Um, has nothing to do with healthcare delivery. The, uh, the infant mortality is a little different. You know, this happens all the time where every country has its own statistics and its own standards that they measure these, you know, infant mortality or whatever um, by. And, uh, you know, frankly, we have, we in the United States try to save every premature baby, no matter how premature. We count all those deaths. We we are try to save hopeless cases and we count those as, as, as deaths as well. Um, that doesn't really, uh, Europeans don't do that. Germans and French, I forget exactly which countries, but they have different standards in how they, they calculate those deaths. Um, we are also a country that even with the influx of immigrants that are, that are going on right now in, in Europe in the last few years, we're still taking more immigrants and we typically take in more immigrants from, from places of, of, of poverty. So when you have these statistics sort of first generation that are worse health-wise, for instance, they get better uh, generationally. So, uh, and, and the third thing you mentioned is spending. We do, we spend a lot more and we are in the lead in almost every technological advancement that you could come up with when it comes to medical care. Medical care costs a lot of money. Um, Europeans pay for it as well. They just pay through taxation, high taxation. They pay through different ways. We pay for it out of our pockets. So it seems like it's more expensive in many ways, uh, though it's not. Now, I just quickly wanna say, different European countries have different systems. Some are better than others. Some are less socialistic than others. Britain is a great example of how you don't want to have health care. You know, uh, it's just essentially a socialist system where the government runs the hospitals, et cetera. And that's why rich people don't stay in Britain for their surgeries. They often get on planes and come here to have them. Um, so those are just some of the reasons. Yeah, so to drill down on this a little more, you're essentially saying the populations that are going into health care and using health care system or resources uh, in, let's say, Britain or France versus the United States are, are going in with different underlying conditions, but that the healthcare system itself is performing better given sort of the issues of, of the folks who are going into it underlying. Is that correct? Like, for, for instance, if you look at, yes, for instance, if you look at survival rates of, of cancer, and just almost any cancer, we do better than European countries. These are kind of statistics, I think, that matter more than simply looking at life expectancy, because life expectancy can be, you know, there are numerous factors that go into that. When you look at survival rates of breast cancer or prostate cancer or um, things like that, and, you know, I list them in the book, I mean, there are many. I think we, we outperform 
almost all European nations on almost all of, of those. A detection, we, we outperform Europe um, when it comes to cancer and other things. I mean, again, Europeans are a wealthy place. I'm not contending that they have bad health care. My, my, my argument is that their system, their policies, their underlying policies of socialized medicine for the most part, but you know, different sorts of systems don't outperform us in any, in any real way. Um, what about something that makes me personally crazy? And we talked about this a little bit before we started recording. Um, what about the tolerance of people in, let's say, a France or a Germany um, versus the United States to people who might have a different ethnic background, different religion? Um, because just anecdotally, and I'll let you fill it in with the, the real data um, that, that you lay out in your book, but anecdotally, it seems to me that people who say that the United States is a more racist place than, say, France um, ha are just people who have not spent a lot of time in Europe um, or, or interacted at length with Europeans in a way that isn't just as a tourist in a cafe, because uh, just anecdotally, that, that seems completely opposite to, um, to my experience. But I'll let you fill in the actual argument underneath my prejudices. <laughs> Let me just quickly preface all of this by saying that, you know, America is not only the most tolerant place right now in the world or more tolerant than Europe, it's the most tolerant place that's ever existed in the history of mankind. People mock me for saying that, they'll bring up slavery and this and that. I'm just saying that there are people who live around me here in DC in the area who would be killing themselves in any other situation, who have been enemies for centuries sometimes a thousand years, who live here in peace. They send their kids to the same schools. They, 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 they're friends um, and they do the same sorts of things. We assimilate people really well here. Let's just set aside illegal immigration, which is problematic because it doesn't allow for assimilation in, this, in, 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 a, in a organic or a healthy way. Um, Europe, can, structurally, because these places have existed for so long, they have a hard time even living next, they've had a hard time until the last 70 years, even being bordering each other, much less living together in any sort of peaceful way. The idea, there are generational slums and ghettos in France where people um, from North Africa or from Islamic, other Islamic nations can't, don't assimilate. And it's a problem of the people who, who won't for you know, reasons we can get into, but also the structure and system and belief system of these countries that they don't demand it of those people, right? Language, culture, and those sorts of uh, acclimation in, in that sort of way. Um, but yeah, just anecdotally, I give a bunch of, uh, I mean, actually, I quantify a bunch with polls, you can believe them or not. But in Europe, um, most nations have far higher levels of discrimination against uh, newcomers, for instance, or even um, minorities in, in hiring, in wanting to live some, next to someone who isn't like you, and all of those areas. But anecdotally, I have a bunch of students, for instance, who are African Americans who went to Europe thinking that it was going to be this, you know, utopia where they had to deal with much more um, physical, real world, you know, real life racism, not just comments, but actually being denied service, things of that nature. And anyone who's been to Europe enough and didn't just hang out at the tourist spots, they might, they would probably notice this sort of thing, especially obviously if they're a minority. Why do you think Americans are so open um, to to newcomers? Is it just because we are historically a nation that accepts immigrants from a large variety of peoples? Is it our our prosperity that allows us to be kind of more more welcoming um, to people? I mean, what what do you think? It's obviously speculation, but what do you think the psychological traits are of Americans that have been developed over our history that? We are, and I, I know that there are people on the left like listening to this and scoffing right now. Oh, Americans are more open to newcomers, but um, you really make a good case in this book that Americans are are the most open people in the world. We are, we are. I mean, and, and you know, when people get mad or you know on Twitter and yell at me, I just ask for examples. I mean, um, why I think we're built for it. That doesn't mean that you know there aren't uh, nativists out there. It doesn't mean that uh, you know we're perfect in how you know when the Irish came or the Italians came or the Jews came, you know, obviously there's, 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 um, there are people who are, who are not welcoming of them. Um, so we're imperfect, of course, but in the end, I mean, there's just no place that has, uh, you know, 
brought in as many different kinds of religions and creeds and, and ethnicities and allowed people to live together. And the great thing about it is that they're successful. So I think prosperity does have something to do with it. If we were really struggling, we would be less inclined to welcome newcomers, I think. Um, but you take any minority group in the world and you compare how they do wherever they come from to here and they always do better here economically. Um, I keep throwing the stat around, but if, if the British were a state in the United States, it would be the second poorest state after Mississippi per capita. I mean, that I don't know if people here realize how much wealth we do have, um, but take you can take Somalis, Nigerians, Hungarians, the Swedes, even Scandinavians do far better here than they do there. Um, so that's part of it. But I just think that, and it, to be fair to Europe, we're, we're built for that. We are not, you know, we, we, we are open to other kinds of people because we're all at some point newcomers here and um, my own parents were immigrants. And so I think that that culture of, of opening, you know, being open to other types of people because everyone's a different type of person around you really, right? So um, it works, but it only works, of course, is not, it only works if we all accept the same foundational ideas about the world. Not, we can bring some of our culture, but there are certain ideas, ideas we have to share to live like this, which I think the left has been corroding with identitarian politics and class-based politics. These are European things mostly. Not Americans have never been obsessed with class in the same way because they believe in meritocracy, I think, in general, and that they can move from class to class. So th those are important factors, I think, in, in, in why we're open to newcomers. Yeah, there, there really is a, a both a carrot and a stick in America. And sometimes I think, for example, Britain has no uh, no assimilatory stick, and uh, France, for example, has no assimilatory carrot, right? Um, in the sense that in America, at least prior to, to uh, what you're talking about, the identitarianism that seems to have swapped the country from the left, uh, there was... <laughs> There was the expectation that you would assimilate, um, that you would learn English, that you would uh, sort of participate in American holidays like Thanksgiving, that you would um, assimilate in sort of a public way, even if you kept your culture in a private way. Uh, but on the other hand, that acceptance, that real American acceptance of being treated just like every other American citizen really is on offer here in a way that it it isn't. In, in France, for example, you have third generation um you know, French people who, whose families came, let's say their grandparents or their great grandparents came from uh, another country, and they're not considered French, even though they know no other life, no other language. Um, but you, you can see that there's still this huge divide between people who are even three generations in and people considered ethnically French. Um, whereas Britain, I think, like doesn't demand assimilation at all uh, from a lot of its immigrants that they've found that to be, I don't know, discriminatory in some ways. So I really think that's true. But let, let's return to the question of, of prosperity and wealth here for a minute. Um, you know, some of the stats you cite are, I think, shocking, even to me, somebody like me who is aware that uh, or was previously aware of American wealth vis-a-vis um, -vis even Western European nations. Um, but what what are the real sort of wealth disparities um, between the way that the average German or Frenchman or even Brit lives in comparison uh, to the United States. You mean how how does that wealth manifest in living a better right. life? Or, well, or like mean, household income or or um, purchasing power, things, yeah, things household, like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have the stats all memorized, but our household income per, is far higher and even medium in, median income. I mean, almost any statistic you look at, other than a few like Luxembourg and Monaco and these kind of city states where everyone's rich, you know. Um, but more than that, and this is what the left, many left or urban leftists look down at, you know, we live in suburbs in mansions. <laughs> a European would look at that and say, that's a mansion there. I think on average, like a thousand square, and I might be off on this a little bit, but I think our average house is like a thousand square foot bigger. I mean, you know, if you go to Europe, if you go to these countries and you use the shower or you just live life there for a while, not in a fancy hotel, but in the real world, you would know, you would see what the difference is in comfort level. Um, now, you know, many sophisticated people look at that and they think, you know, they think it's nefarious for people to be using so much energy and having these giant cars and using these roads and having huge houses with big lawns. I think it's, it's wonderful. And I don't think we should feel any guilt over it. Um, so I think those those are the way, but there's a, something else, you know, and, and, and 
I feel like I rem or sometimes I'm made fun of for romanticizing America in this way, but I believe it. You know, it's it's not just even if we became like Europe, we would still be rich. Probably we would still be basically have most freedoms, I guess, but it would be an insipid place because Europe is an insipid place. There's no creativity. There's very little entrepreneurship in the way that you think about it here. People are scared to take risk. People are more docile. People are more pliant. You ask them, um, would you rather have a job for life or would you rather be able to like achieve your dream? And like huge numbers of Europeans just want a safe job. You know, this is a, this is because people came here, took risk. The idea of taking risk is embedded in American lore. Like almost every famous CEO or whatever always has failure on his resume, even if he makes it up, right? Like everyone has to, failure is not thought of as an end. It's thought of as just a step to whatever you're going to be and do, and you can do anything. Now, these are sometimes idealized, um, you know, idealized. It's an idealizer, a mythology about America. No place is perfect. And we are a meritocracy, but obviously there, you know, some people are born into situations that are, 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 are much harder than others. But the idea that you can do that sort of thing, I think, is what makes us very different. In Europe, I don't, you know, I have stats or polls to back this up, but most Europeans don't even believe a poor person can pull themselves out of poverty with hard work. Here, it's like 80% of people think you can. And that's, I think, a, an important different, difference. I, I don't know what question you asked because I just wandered way off topic, but I just wanted to make those yeah. points. I. I, th I think that's really a good point about how, and you make this sum in the book, but how these societies end up being self-reinforcing or the ideas, right? If you talk about how the majority of people in European countries don't believe that they can pull themselves out of poverty, um, it may be that it's more difficult, right? Uh, within a, a socialized system where you have a very, very comfortable and regulated life for employees that are already in the system. But as you point out in this book, very high un unemployment for young people, very difficult to break into the system at the bottom. I, I, I think of it as actually something similar to the way that, for example, teachers unions work um, in the United States, right? It's last in, first out. Um, you, you don't advance through merit or by being a, a truly excellent teacher, producing good scores or, or um, happy parents. You advance through a union created system that is very, very comfortable once you're sitting in it, um, but is really, really tough to advance up into from the bottom. Right. So um, that that may be just like a self-reinforcing loop, don't you think? That it's oh, think so. harder to get out of it, that people consequently become more fatalistic about their position in society? Oh, no, I, I think that's exactly right. I think that you have this kind of systems where not all, listen, again, every, you know, there is cultural forces as well. Scandinavians were, you know, are very communal. They work very hard, like, you know, not to say like Italians don't work hard, but they don't, you know, they don't work as hard as the German, for instance. There's different, because they have different lifestyles and a different cultural identity and things like that. But, um, but I think that, yes, I mean, I think you have a structure where people are comfortable and that's what they want to be and, and they don't want to break out of that. Um, so, yeah, teachers unions are a perfect example of the kind of kind of uh, safety that Europeans aspire to in their, you know, in their world where Americans don't really want that most of the time. Like there's always this, there'll be a piece in the Atlantic or some, or some you know, New York Times and, and the headline will be like, can you believe how many hours Americans work compared to Europeans? You know, they work 10 hours more a week, whatever. And this is supposed to be something that we're, we're horrified by. Like we should be working less. We should have a four day work week, or we should, you know, be like the French who aren't allowed to work on weekends, but we're not like that. I think that we gain a lot of our um, identity through our work. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm not saying people should be overworked, but we don't frown on work. We don't look at it and say, oh my God, I mean, we need a four day work week and government needs to compel that companies do this or that. I mean, I think more and more we are like that, but we shouldn't be. That wasn't the American identity in the past. I don't think people looked at work and celebrated success and wealth and things of that nature. Um, not that it's always wealth, by the way. I also want to throw that in. It's about how you live your life. And in, in America, you could live your life in a million different sorts of ways. You could go out to the desert. You could go, you know, geographically, but you can have the lifestyle you want. It just depends where you you live and the things you want to do. You have a lot more choices here. Let's talk a little bit more about the American attitude towards work and, and life meaning. I mean, you, you hear folks like Andrew Yang, who I generally actually 
find to be an interesting character on the left, but um, you know, advancing something like a universal basic income in the United States and, and saying that, in fact, it'll free people to do exactly the sort of entrepreneurial and interesting and artistic things um, that you're talking about. Do you think that if America institute something like a UBI, because even you even get some libertarians making this argument, right, that um, that it would free people towards more creativity, more entrepreneurship, more sort of creative um, endeavors? Or do you think that it, we would end up with people who suffer a malaise of meaning in much the same way as we've seen with, with um, manufacturing leaving the Rust Belt, right, where people turn to uh, welfareism and also to drug addiction and and um, to d they end up suicide and other deaths of despair end up uh, going through the roof that there is some like inherent even if it's an American cultural thing or maybe it's an inherent human thing connection between work and and dignity and meaning here that perhaps Euro Europeans don't don't either have the same kind of cultural connection or maybe they do and they're suffering some of the same consequences um I think that that there there are some similar problems there with uh, manufacturing and things like that. Though my view is that manufacturing goes away because of creative destruction. There's not much you can do about that. I don't think there's any sort of policy prescription for that. But um, I actually I think that a uh, a universal basic income would be a far better idea than a giant welfare state because welfare state makes you dependent in, in different sorts of ways. It disincentivizes work in general. I, I, at least I think it disincentivizes having a family and, and living your life a certain way. Whereas a basic income, granted that we get rid of the welfare state, which will never happen. So this is why we're never going to have a, a basic income, but is a better idea. I'd rather give people cash to live than than this, you know, this ridiculous system where they have to, you know, you know, answer, you know, that that they're sort of incentivized not to work, basically. So, I mean, that's a little more complicated a question. I think that there, I think that that does happen in Europe because you have this giant bureaucracy that not only people who are struggling are dependent on the welfare state, everyone is dependent on the welfare state in Scandinavian countries. They say, hey, you know, we get free healthcare, we get free this, we get free that. Yeah, but the state is telling you exactly what you're going to get. That to me, I just find that to be an un-American idea. I mean, the, the, first of all, it eliminates a lot of the choices you have in the world. It it undermines, it, once you're dependent, it undermines risk-taking again, entrepreneurship. Um, and if that happens in a Scandinavian country where Scandinavians are incredibly successful people, imagine what it would do to other populations. I just don't think it saps the will. You know, like I said, I think it just creates an insipid place that it only cares about safety and, and things like that. So. Also, this is a little broader, but having giant bureaucracies is dangerous for freedom in general. And I'll give you an example. You know, Donald Trump becomes president. There's a giant bureaucracy in the State Department. They decide he's not going to be president, right? They're going to run the country. We have a pandemic. The CDC decides it's going to run the country. It, it issues eviction moratoriums. I mean, this is dangerous for freedom. There is no um, you know, but the bureaucracy is so big, it's almost impossible to fight it. And that's what happens when you have in Europe layers of bureaucracy, the European Union, then you have the nation state bureaucracies, and then even local ones. So um, to me, the giant welfare state, the bureaucracies that come with that are the most dangerous thing that Europe would, you know, dangerous European idea that would be, ex could be exported here. Um, but interestingly, so... I agree and I don't because I think European bureaucracy, if we leave outside the EU for a moment in Brussels, um, oftentimes kind of basic services like getting this document or that document seems to function marginally better in Europe. And, and maybe it's because of the, the, the best and brightest of America don't become bureaucrats, right? Um, There's so many other opportunities for, for people uh, to advance and, and to do well for themselves and other fields that going up through the government and becoming a, a, a sort of compliance bureaucrat is not very high on the list. Um, but it does seem like even though they have these layers of bureaucracy, the bureaucracy that the United States has is more incompetent. Um, in, and I'm thinking about the withdrawal, for example, from Afghanistan and the way that the Pentagon seems to have handled that. Um, and then just the, the experiences with like the DMV or, you know, needing to, to get 
some sanitation department thing done in an American city, um, these things are actually more difficult. They're the ones that have, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult to get anybody to, to pay attention to what you need. It's, it's totally incompetent. You have to go back multiple times because people are unclear about what needs to be done. I mean, that's one thing I will say in some of these European countries' favor, that at least they have plenty of bureaucracy, but it seems to be more functioning. No, I think that's right. I mean, I don't have a ton of experience with that, but I, I think that it's it's clear that they're better at running these bureaucracies than in, in the United States, where it's very messy because of localism and what you know who's in charge of what and, and this sort of thing. But I mean, it's true as well that Europeans can like, you know, they can pull it together and build like a, a high speed rail from one or, a, you know, a train from one city to the next. As someone pointed out to me today, part of that is that the whole continent was leveled after World War II, so it's easier to sort of build new uh, transportation hubs and things like that. But still, um, that's true. I mean, going back to the to, to Prussians and to the you know, Austro-Hungarian Empire, they already had bureaucracies. They came up with the idea of social security in, in Prussia, in Germany, etc. So they're better at that sort of thing. But the thing is, I don't want bureaucracy here. I want it to be messy because I don't want it to exist. So um, it's messier, just as politics is messier here in general. All our politics is messier because of the diversity we have. So like in the book, I have a stat about the Finnish and how 91% of them are always supportive of the government, no matter who's running the government. They're just much more inclined to be part of that system, as you mentioned. So to get ahead in, in these countries because of the giant welfare state and bureaucracies that they have, they probably do get better people. I mean, most people here who want to be successful don't go and, you know, who want to make money or invent something. They don't go to the government to do it. They go out into the private sector. Yeah, I'm thinking here about the the show The Americans. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but the the difference in spy quality between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, you know, sort of the bumbling FBI and CIA. Um, but at the end of the day, that kind of great American middle and the enormous productivity of Americans and the enormous freedom of Americans defeated the Soviet Union, even though in, in this this kind of administrative way, or even in, in these kinds of, uh, when you go toe to toe with the Soviet spies, I think there was a, a large element of truth that the way the Americans portrayed that. Yeah, uh, I have to say over the last few years, there has not been a, a bureaucracy that hasn't failed us, right? I mean, I try to think about what in American government works, and I don't see much that does. Um, from from our armed forces, frankly, all you know, to the FBI, to our to to the CDC, and on and on. Um, the thing is, we're successful in sp despite the in spite of them. And you know, my my uh, my defense of America is not a defense of our <laughs> of our bureaucracies, which I think are are terrible. And in the age of Twitter, we see we get a glimpse of the people who are actually running it, which is horrifying. But I suspect that European there are plenty of. Uh, terrible people within European bureauc bureaucracies as well. So Scandinavia keeps coming up, and I think that's one of the enduring kind of white whale shimmering city on the hill style. I'm mixing metaphors here, but uh, myths for a certain type of leftist in America, right? That um, they have an enormous uh, welfare state, you know, they have long maternity and paternity leaves. Um, they they have higher taxes and and um, very generous benefits from the state. Uh, and and they always point to the surveys that these are the happiest people in the world. But um, so so how much of that is true? And how much of it uh, is a lack of understanding of how the, the Swedish or Finnish or, or Norwegian system actually works? I just want to say happiness is overrated in the sense that people ask those questions. First of all, I, first of all, it's very difficult to quantify what happiness really even means to people. And uh, Scandinavians are always happy. They're very content all the time, no matter what's going on. That's the type of people they are. So those polls are always kind of ridiculous. Um, well, I, you know, first of all, scaling that kind of system to the United States would mean building the biggest bureaucracy that's ever existed in, in you know, the history of mankind. It wouldn't even, it would be just immense. Um, we're talking about countries with four, five, nine million people here. One of them, a country like Norway is actually just an oil petro state, petrol state, which gives out money, you know, gives out checks for its oil, from its oil profits. So, 
Um, it's a very different setup. But more than that, what really bugs me about progressives is they talk about the welfare state there and then they pretend it's a socialist place, which it's not. Denmark, for instance, is a capitalist place with a huge, well, you know, that props up this welfare state. They are have lower levels of regulation and more free trade than we do, probably. Um, and then they people want this welfare state. That's fine. But, you know, people pay 60 percent of their salaries, at least in taxation. I mean, the liberals here are progressives. They want to have that kind of welfare state, but they don't really want to pay for it. The, the, in Denmark, they pay they pay for it. Everyone pays for it. They have a wide tax base um, and they pay for it. Now, I don't think it would work here anyway, but the very idea that uh, they, they're pretending they want to import that system here, but they don't really. They want just rich people to pay for it or print money. And that is not how it works there. Um, and also it doesn't, you know, it's not as rosy in general as, as they make out. I mean, they, for them, again, free health care, free college, all these things are important. But I think that that adds in such a big country as this, there's moral hazards that come with that as well. But it also would just make us less competitive and uh, less entrepreneurial and all, all of those things. And, and Scandinavian societies have, one, they're more homogenous, as you point out, but they have really high levels of social trust and trust in their government. I, I often think even, even if one were willing to lay aside the financial considerations of building that kind of welfare state, I mean, can you imagine the American welfare state that would be built? It would be you know, administered by the same people that we were just talking about, the incompetent bureaucrats who can't figure out how to you know, um, secure an air base on, on the way out of, of um, Afghanistan or, or can't figure out, or I keep thinking about um, the, the Hawaiian bureaucrat who accidentally launched a missile alert across the entire island. Yeah. Um, I just, I, the idea I, I, that Americans could competently administer that kind of massive welfare state, I think would require a total transformation in the kind of people that we are. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, Scandinavians have high levels of trust in their in their bureaucracy, their government, their politicians within their communities. They're small countries. I mean, Scandinavians are very successful in, in the United States as well, and they're more successful here than they are in Scandinavia. There's that famous quote where uh, economists asked, told Milton Friedman, you know, we have no poor people in Scandinavia. He's like, that's interesting because we have no poor Scandinavians in, in the United States either, right? I mean, uh, but people are very... Um, it's weird how identitarian people are, but when you point out something like that, they get very offended. But the truth of the matter is Scandinavians are successful people. They're not like Americans. I'm not saying we're not successful, but they have a very different sort of society and levels of government that they would accept in general uh, would work there. But more than that, our system's not built for that. We have a federal system where states are supposed to be in charge of most things. Um, we don't have a top-down kind of, you know, centralized state that they would like to have, that the Paul Krugmans would like to have here. Um, but Paul Krugman wants to pay with it, you know, with a trillion dollar coin or whatever he's up to now, um, rather than expanding the tax base to everyone, including the poor, paying 60% of their salaries. Um, so overwhelmingly, I was just cheering as I actually listened to this on Audible. I didn't read it. But um, when I was, I was listening to your book, especially, uh, and we chatted a little bit about this beforehand, but similar kind of background, immigrant parents from uh, Eastern Europe. But, um, and, and so much of this is, is, is so true, but I guess the part of it that I found myself kind of doubting or pushing back on as I was listening to it is this overly, um, two points, this sort of overly rosy picture of America um, in terms of America in 2021, as opposed to, I think I would have agreed more with your assessment of America as opposed to Europe uh, in, in let's say, 2010 or, or 2008 than I do uh, now reading this book. Um, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But the, one of the things that kept jumping out at me was your endorsement of American meritocracy. And it's not that I disagree with your idea of American meritocracy. I think I think America was a very robust meritocracy, possibly the most robust meritocracy in the world. But I, I really am starting to doubt that. Um, and, and one stat that kind of slapped me across the face that I've mentioned on this podcast before it comes from a, a book that Michael Lind wrote. Uh, and that is that you are more likely to graduate from university today with a four-year degree um, if you have bottom half math, math scores 
but top half income than the other way around. So how, how do you factor in this growing credentialism um, and, and adding to that, not just the university credentialism, but the growing kind of dead weight and fat in American companies that is around compliance, bureaucracy, diversity and inclusion, um, you know, six figure jobs, uh, like I always think about Michelle Obama's six figure job in a hospital, $400,000 a year, uh, working on diversity and inclusion for a hospital system. I mean, how does all of that, and, and it seems to me to be growing stronger, not weaker in America, square with your vision in this book of America as a robust meritocracy? First of all, it is, is anyone under the impression that those things don't exist in Europe in the same way? I mean, there are always credential, there's credentialism there as well. I'm sure that companies there have uh, compliance officers and, and all kinds of dead weight going on, um, you know, just as in the United States. I, I, I think also when we talk about this and we talk about Michelle Obama, it's a good, it's a fine example. But I mean, how, how many of those people actually exist? I would say it's probably not huge. Um, I don't know what that's, I mean, I think that our, our college, so this is a complicated topic, obviously. I think our, our college system has a, is injected with moral hazard because the government backs loans, which lets people get dumb degrees or lets rich people, you know, get dumb degrees and, and, and all of that. Not, I shouldn't say dumb degree. <laughs> degrees that are. We can say are, dumb uh, degrees yeah. here. We are a, a, a uh, pro <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a journalist, so I, I'm in no position to mock anyone, um, anyone's career. But uh, do you know what I mean? I mean that we have more people with, you know, people in school now with psych, you know, going with, you know, uh, majoring in psychology than engineering, let's say, and we don't need, you know, we need engineers, etc. cetera. Um, but I don't know. I, I mean, I, I still think we're a robust meritocracy. This is the big argument I've had. I mean, Phil Klein, who I work with, wrote a book about, uh, you know, young people and socialism. And I wrote the like pushing back chapter at the end where I make the argument, I think that young people today have it better than young people have ever had it in the United States. I don't really understand where this angst always comes from. Nick, I understand that manufacturing has declined, well, at least jobs have declined in the Midwest and, and, and things like of that nature because technology has overtaken, um, sometimes overtaken those uh, sectors, but that's happened always in American history um, in various industries. People, people are, uh, are wealthier today, they're safer today, they live longer today until very recently, uh, there's been a slight decline. Crime until very recently was was at all time lows basically in the United States. I just don't understand, I mean, you know, that's not to speak to um, the kind of choices we have in jobs. When I, in the seventies, do you think people had more choices in the things that they can do in the world? I just I just feel like a young person today has a, has a far wide open, um, you know, has more sort of professions and vocations that they can go into than they used to be able to go into. So I don't, and I understand that every generation sees itself and, you know, they don't contextualize it in, in, in history, you know, contextualize the whole thing in history and elsewhere. But I just don't understand why, why young people think it's worse in America today than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago. I think it's better for them in most ways. Like, you know, if you have a particular stat, you, you know, you, you disagree with that in some way, I'd be happy to, you know, focus in on it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think in one economic sense, you're right. Although I would say that total uncertainty, there are probably some number of people who prefer, even in America, um, perhaps not the European model, but something closer to the Japanese model, where there is a long standing relationship between a company and its employees, and that there's a lot of stress associated with, for example, the gig economy, or, you know, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, right? Um, not everybody wants to have the stress of not knowing whether their paycheck will come in, regardless of how hard they work. Um, so that's the economic piece of it. But I think the biggest piece of it is our, our family lives and our communities are completely collapsed to uh, when compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? And far more young people today grew up in a household without two married parents. And so while I, I agree with you and sometimes push back against some elements of the right when they talk about, um, you know, the, sort of the economic difficulties that families face today, I always say, well, yeah, they faced a lot worse economic, like families faced a lot worse economic difficulties in the Great Depression, but they stayed together as families. 
um, for the most are, part. Are, are divorce rates higher today than they were in the 70s? Um, I, think that they used I would to say, I think it's more likely that people are less people aren't, aren't married. getting married. Right. So, so people aren't getting married. And so I, what is true is that in 1970, fewer children were born into a situation where their their parents were not their two biological parents were not were not married and together in the same home i i kind of reversed all the words there but you know what i'm saying that um you're much more likely today as a child born let's say in 1995 you're much more likely to have been born uh, to unmarried parents and not to have both your biological parents in the home and i would say that that's actually a really huge deficit in a young person's life, perhaps more than, you know, any graph that points to having higher purchasing power and more electronics in their house. But how, but two things, first of all, Europe has similar problems. Plus they have, they have even fewer children than we do in general. So I think when I say that continent's dying, I mean, literally it's dying. Germany is the second oldest country to Japan, mm -hmm. which where they also don't have children. And I'm not sure, you know, I don't have all the numbers in front of me as to how many uh, children are born into single family, you know, single parent families and things like that. Um, so I don't understand, uh, you know, I, I always feel like a certain kind of conservative believes that it's the wealth that does this to families, right? Um, but I, 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 I just speak that characterization as well, to be clear. I, I don't think there is a direct line between the, the wealth or, or let's say the difficulty, um, in, in making your way in the world from a like financial perspective and the collapse of families. I, I dispute that link as well, just to be right. clear. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, I think there are many, I'm, I'm not an expert on why you know, this is going on in American culture. I think sometimes people exaggerate how bad it is, but it certainly is a, a problem. And probably in some sense has to do with the lack of, uh, in my view, a lack of people losing faith in general. I think people who are religious, tend to stay married longer, tend to be, be divorced less, I, I think, and uh, tend to have more children, I know. Um, so those are important factors. And we're on the same trajectory, we're not on the same trajectory as Europe, but it's pretty bad um, in this country. So, but we were talking about meritocracy. So I don't think that that's connected to why people aren't having family, but let's go back to, you did say, you know, there are a lot of people who don't like the risk of a gig economy job or, 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 or things like that. And I understand that. I just feel like when you have technological advances um, that disrupt society, and we do have that, the internet did that in many ways, I think, um, and automation does that. Uh, there's no really, there's no way to, to, we can't be Luddites about it. We just have to figure out different ways to re-educate people or to find different things for people to do. Um, I always think that one day we're going to have a post-scarcity economy and then I don't know what people are going to do. We're just going to have mass suicides because people do find meaning in their work and, and that helps them have a family and gives them confidence and things like that. So, but I don't really blame that on I mean, I don't think anyone in Europe is, has a better handle on that. I know Hungary and those kind of countries are trying to do that, but they still have pretty low birth rates. I, I think Hungary has a lower birth rate than the United States still. I'm not sure. But um, so anyway, you know, I, do, I don't really understand always how those two things are supposed to be connected. And I'm not saying you're saying that, but that's been an argument out there, I think. Well, let's talk about because you have you do have quite a bit on these comparative mm -hmm. fertility rates in this book. Um, and, and you point to it as a kind of vote of lack of, com lack of confidence in a society's future. Um, the fact that birth rates are dropping both in America, but even more so in most European countries. Um, you know, why, why do you think that is, first of all, um, if it's not connected exactly to economic trends or um, to, because, because you, I think you make the convincing case that it's not, for example, what the left says, oh, that, you know, Scandinavia has a bigger welfare state and more supports for maternity leave, paternity leave, um, more kind of financial benefits from the state for young families. Um, but you make a pretty convincing case that those, those really haven't done much to help the, the birth rate in those countries vis-a-vis -vis America. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the big arguments is that, listen, you know, uh, basically almost a conservative argument that a mom, you know, you should be able to live on one salary and the mom, should, you know, if mom wants to stay home or dad wants to stay home with the kids, that should be, you know, be available to them, paternity leave, all those kinds of uh, 
things. And yet in, Den in, in, in Scandinavian countries, it's not like people are having more kids now because they have that kind of backup from the state. Um, whereas in some, you know, Eastern European countries where they have far less backup from the state, they have more, more kids in some spots. I mean, generally Europe all, across the board is having just very few children. The thing is the stats I have in my book, since I, after I wrote it in that, and when it was in production, we had, I forgot what the poll, who, 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 uh, maybe it was the census actually, we learned that actually our birth rate had gone down even more. So we're almost at like European levels, which is, which is quite bad. Um, that's I think probably that that's direct, a, directly to do with the pandemic, though, right? I mean, if we're talking about, I think it was over a longer span, but I'm not sure. Longer? It might have been. It might have okay. been. Might have been. But what, however, however you slice it, it's not a good trend. I think when you have a younger country, you have a more vibrant country, you have a more, um, you have a population that's more involved in the cares more about the future, frankly, you know, or you know, and, and you just have newer people, new blood, and and a lot going on. Whereas in European culture, you don't have much of that. Um, uh, but, you know, and I do actually think it has something to do with wealth. As you get wealthier, you have fewer kids. I think that that's, your, that's how it used to be uh, in, in the United States. So the wealthier, you know, if you are in a higher class strata of economic, uh, you know, strata of economic class, you would have probably two kids instead of three or four. Um, in Europe, only, most of the uh, Islamic immigrants have the most kids and, you know, people who are there don't. So, um, but... It's a bad trend and I don't know, you know, we can blame it on economics, but in Eastern Europe where people are poorer than Western Europe, they also don't have children. So I, I don't, you know, every kind of system in the West, no matter what you're doing, childbirths are going down. So it must be something else that's going on, not, not uh, you know, any sort of system that incentivizes people or disincentivizes people to have kids. I just don't buy that if you give someone a tax break, for instance, they're gonna have more kids. It's just might help you if you have kids, but I don't think anyone's saying, wow, a thousand bucks, I'll have a kid for the rest, you know, I'll have a kid. Um, and Hungary gives you lots of like incentives to have kids, but they barely move the needle really. And uh, so maybe long-term it'll prove to be more successful, but I, I haven't seen it yet be that successful yet. Um, let me ask you a last question before I let you go here. Is European slow decline possible? For America, even laying aside all of your concerns about what the consequences of that kind of safe and low growth, welfare heavy um, kind of safetyism, you know, whatever, like um, like with, with a thumb on the scale more towards stability and safety uh, than entrepreneurship and risk. Um, is that even possible for America or if what what will happen if we, what would happen if we implemented something similar uh, to, say, the French system or the German system in the United States? Again, I think we'd remain wealthy and all of that would just be less creative and less innovative. Also, there are, it, the difference here is there are still big parts of the country where people don't want that. And people are, you know, horrified by the idea of government telling them what to do in the way that they do European. So problem there is like not, not a problem. You know, people talk now about splitting up and this sort of thing. I just think that it's more an urban against rural and maybe suburban kind of thing where it's, you can't really split up. It doesn't work that way. We're too interconnected. Not that I want to. I'm just, you know, that's an argument that's been 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 out there. Um, so what I think would happen is that, uh, you know, I just don't think it can happen in the same way, but I still think that a, a really strong federal government, we saw it during the pandemic, the pandemic really made me nervous in a way that I haven't been in a long time. I've been basically positive about our future because I always kind of trust that the American people won't go for it in the long run. But it went the way we had governors uh, through fiat unilaterally shutting down a church and everyone's like, okay, you know, basically courts are like, okay. Um, I think that that and, and shutting down the entire economy in that way without any debate, without any vote, I think that that uh, portends poorly for the future in many ways. Now that's changed a little bit. So my, my, I feel a little bit better about things, but um, I was going, I was talking to someone else about that Ruth Marcus story where she was, I don't know if you saw that, where she's in the elevator and she didn't wear her mask. 
or she was wearing a mask and some dude wasn't. And she said, you know, I think you should wear your mask. This is really wrong. And he said, I don't care what you think, you know, like, I don't care what you think to me is a good American credo, really. And I think too many people think that way to allow a European style, of, you know, bureaucratic state to exist. But there are enough voters now, unfortunately, to try it. And I think it would even be worse than Europe in a way, because like I said, we don't really want to pay for these things. It will, as you pointed out, our, the way we run bureaucracy is pretty bad and uh, incompetent because we're, that's not what we're supposed to have here. And all those things, I think, would make it really ugly and messy in ways that would, would, be, would be, have severe political blowback in some places. So I don't know how it plays out. So I don't think it would be exactly like a European system, but I think that uh, it could be, it could implementing those sorts of things could be bad. And it's always mission creep, right? It's like right now, uh, Biden, you know, they wanted to pass 3.5 trillion European style created cradle to grave welfare bill. So now they're like 1.5 trillion, but it's always incremental. It's always uh, mission creep. It's always, you know, they just want to, whatever they can get down, they want to get down and it grows and grows. And it's, it's distressing because it almost never, maybe twice in the 20th century, it's been in 21st century, there's been some pushback, maybe during the 20s and maybe Reagan, right? And even that was barely much in the real world. So uh, there's just been a long generational move towards being more like Europe. And uh, lately, I think it's accelerated. And I think that's pretty scary. Um, well, uh, certainly when folks read your book, they will see all of the downsides of a European style system and society that I think you're totally right. We don't talk about, um, particularly on the left, but even on the right, that, that we would lose a lot of ourselves as Americans and even things that folks on the left like about themselves as Americans, um, are kind of incompatible, uh, with the way that European systems function. But David, thank you so much for coming on High Noon. Can you tell folks where they can buy your book, Euro Trash? Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, any place books are sold, I hope, Amazon and Barnes and Noble, places like that. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to inez.stepman at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving a comment on or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or iwf.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.